All right. This is such an exciting time. I'm so very excited to be in the space today with the Miriam Kaba. Miriam Kaba is an organizer, educator, librarian, and prison industrial complex PIC abolitionist who is active in movements for racial, gen racial gender, and transformative justice. Kaba is the founder and director of Project NIA, a grassroots abolitionist organization with the vision to end youth incarceration. Miriam co-leads an initiative, Interrupting Criminalization, a project she co-founded with our comrade, Andrea Ritchie, in 2018. Welcome, welcome, welcome to the space, and thank you so much for joining us. How are you today? I am hanging in there. Thank you so much for inviting me to be in conversation with you. I'm um, looking forward to it. Wonderful. Thank you so much. So our first question that we have for you and that I know so many others who are joining us at our event would like to know, who is Miriam Kaba? That's a really, uh, <laughs> what the, what a fraught question, right? Like, I think, how would anybody answer that question, right? You read a little bit about my bio, um, but I will say that I I uh, was born in New York City. Um, I came of age in New York City in um, the 1980s. I was born in 1971, um, but I was kind of conscious of myself as a person and as a human um, through the 1980s. And growing up in New York City during that time was a very special and specific moment um, in New York's history, we were kind of like in the um, New Jack City phase of the city, a lot of kind of um, moral panic about crime um, and a, a, like high levels, much higher levels of interpersonal violence than we have today in the city. Um, I grew up in the kind of um, Ronald Reagan uh, you know, emergence um, of the early early 80s through um, the mid 80s and then uh, Papa Bush, uh, you know, uh, George W. Bush's father. Mm -hmm. It was a weird political moment um, as well in the city in terms of who we had as mayors. Um, I say all that to say that I kind of got steeped in the juices of the politics of the city and it really shaped my trajectory I think um, and kind of shaped my worldview quite a bit. Um, I came to prison industrial complex abolition and transformative justice through my work to end um, racialized and gender-based violence in particular and I guess I realized that prison normalizes and reproduced violence rather than ending it. So mm -hmm. because I considered myself to be an anti-violence organizer, I was like, I can't very well also support the existence of prisons and policing. Like, how is that going to make sense? Mm -hmm. um, so I think my longstanding and ongoing project as an organizer really has been focused on, as I mentioned, ending racialized and gendered systems of violence that are organized through the prison industrial complex, um, which includes prisons, policing, and surveillance. So, um, yeah, and I started organizing as a teenager. So for those of you who are hearing this and are young people, um, I started as a very young person with friends and kind of stayed organizing ever since. Um, yeah, it's a little bit about me. Yeah, thanks so much for sharing. And I've been getting some of those juicy tidbits about your um, organizing history in your latest book. You want to tell us a little bit about the your book that just launched not too long ago? Yeah, yeah. Um, I have a new book that is, well, relatively new, came out in May um, that was co-authored with my friend um, Kelly Hayes, um, and it's called Let This Radicalize You, and the title comes from kind of a, a, a saying that I had um, years ago on Twitter um, when something very horrible had happened. Um, I kind of, like, tweeted out, let this radicalize you rather than lead you to despair. 
And that became something that people just picked up and started using. Um, I started seeing people use them at protest signs and in other spaces. And so the book is essentially a call for thinking about how we're going to organize um, and how we're going to revolutionize reciprocal care um, in a time of collapse. Um, mm. This is really a time of collapse on so many levels. And we're trying to help people to understand um, that, yes, this is an era of collapse. But as my friend Kelly mentions regularly, we have to be builders in an era of collapse. And that is its own um, kind of its own particular thing that we have to be specifically paying attention to. So I think the book is really clear eyed um, about the reality that we have a lot of problems and ongoing calamities facing the world. We don't attempt to kind of sugarcoat that because it's right in front of us. But mm -hmm. I think we also are clear that as the poet Elizabeth Alexander says that this is not the only news. Um, right. Good and bad things happen in parallel. Mm -hmm. And that that is actually the clear eyed assessment of the world. So yeah, we, we really, we want people to understand that, you know, yes, um, there are bad things, but we don't want them to feel cynical about that because um, cynicism is kind of turbo fuel for your opposition. And if we uh -huh. want to beat our opposition, um, we have to plan to deprive them of their fuel. So yeah, that's a little mm -hmm. bit about the general kind of a hundred, you know, hundred feet of the the, the book. <laughs> Yes, it's been so delicious. I've been appreciating reading it and sharing it and telling our youth um, um, and young people in our space, you guys got to grab some of these chapters. Even if you don't get through the whole thing, grab a few chapters mm -hmm. and read through it. Um, you talked about Project Nia. Tell us what Project Nia is. Uh, did I say anything about Project Nia? I don't think I did, but Project Nia is um, an organization that I started um, in 2009. And it is an organization that will sunset at the end of December of this year. Mm -hmm. um, so we are sunsetting the organization. Um, and I think Project Nia really started for me as a five-year plan. Um, I do my life as five-year plans. And so um, it started off as kind of coming out of my frustration with what I was seeing at the time I was living in Chicago. I spent over 20 years living in Chicago and um, working and organizing and living. And I um, was seeing the way that juvenile justice issues and young people were talked about either from a grass tops way of thinking about it, like policy, and they were tokenized there if they were there at all. And then there was kind of like the grass roots, but young people were also not leading there, you know? It was still super adult defined, adult dominated in so many kinds of ways. And I thought, wouldn't it be interesting to have a space that really offered young people opportunity for self-determining how they wanted to fight around issues of juvenile justice and youth incarceration in particular. And at the time, uh, in Chicago, there wasn't an explicitly uh, abolitionist kind of container for young people to do that. And so mm -hmm. Project Nia was an attempt to make that possible with an idea that I would um, kind of just cede the space um, to young folks to come up with their own projects and that we would be kind of an umbrella for those projects in various ways, a support, an incubator, a catalyst. Um, and that's what we ended up doing for almost going on to 15 years now. Um, and it was finally time a couple of years ago, I made the announcement that we would sunset at the end of this year. And that's what we're doing. We're closing in a good way. Sounds like some amazing work has been done there. And um, that gap that you were referring to in regards to um, there wasn't an abolitionist container for young people sounds very similar 
So as here in Milwaukee, um, we unfortunately have a youth prison or detention center that will be built in actually the um, automatic district that we are organizing in. And some of that work to bring that prison, it's being closed somewhere um, in northern Wisconsin and being brought here. And the word um, from other organizers and some young people who had helped to lead that space was that, you know, well, at least we can bring them closer to home, you know, and of course we push back on that, but it made me think about that when you said, uh, you know, there is no, there hasn't been a container for young people who have an abolitionist frame or analysis to say, actually, we, we don't want the detention center anywhere. We don't want it closer to home. We don't want it there. We don't want it anywhere. Yeah. And so that is also the container that we are looking to build as we're um, preparing to build our youth arm here at the African-American Roundtable. So I want to go into these things about experiments. So um, our celebration of programs, we are celebrating some of the work that we've done over uh, the last year. And we're super excited about our participatory budgeting um, project that we led here on the Northwest side in Milwaukee and also an asset mapping um, project as well. Uh, can you talk to us and then we'll, I'll share a little bit more about the two projects, but can you talk to us about the importance of these types of experiments happening in our community? Why is it so important? Um, well, you know, I'm a big uh, believer in um, kind of in the importance of, how should I put this in the best possible way? I think that the only way that we're going to actually get free and have liberation um in on the horizon is if we try a lot of different things because there's not one pathway to getting to one destination there are multiple pathways and there are multiple ways that we can get there and that actually should make us feel um buoyed and kind of more encouraged because it means that no one person has one answer that we need to find to kind of get the holy grail of liberation. But rather, what we need are a bunch of people doing a bunch of different kinds of things in a bunch of different ways to see what is actually possible. And to be able to also incorporate all the different people who have a different view of what the things that are needed are. We're not cookie cutter. We are different. We are going to want different things. We also have different talents and different offerings to bring to the larger fight. So I think for me, that's what I see as kind of really important when we talk about um, experiments. And it, it comes really from I, years ago, somebody was like, tell me what the quote unquote alternative is then to prisons. They were so upset, you know? And I was like, first of all, I don't believe in that framing of an alternative to prison, because what does that do? When you think of alternative to prison, what does that center? It centers the prison. Your brain goes mm -hmm. right away to thinking about all of the different kinds of ways that we use prisons today. And then you're like, well, we get to find the opposite of that for all these other ways. That just kind of confines your mind. It doesn't mm -hmm. expand it. It doesn't break out of this way of thinking about how we handle harm. So I was like, we don't need one thing. That's the point. The prison is one thing. It's like you bring a hammer and then everything looks like a nail, right? So I'm mm -hmm. like, what we need is a million different experiments. We need a yes. hundred different ways to get out of situation. Because again, not all harms are the same. Not all people are the same. Not all people need the same kinds of things, right? Um, and so we really have to be much more nimble and much more creative and much more kind of open to different possibilities. So I think for what you all are trying to do with participatory budgeting is to help people think about governance and to think about, okay, what is your role in that? And part of governing ourselves is deciding how we're gonna use the resources we have as a collective. And so mm -hmm. in part, what participatory budgeting offers is an opportunity to kind of rehearse together how to do that how to do that in a small way, and then how to grow that 
to be able to take more and more and more direct democracy over how we share and partition resources so that we can say, no, these are not our priorities. No, we're not gonna put a whole bunch of more money into the military and into death-making institutions. No, we want life-affirming institutions to get yes. all the resources, right? As it stands mm -hmm. right now, the life-affirming resources get much less of a share than the death-making ones. So we want to shift the balance. We want to shift the power. We want to take that and put the priorities here instead. So participatory budgeting allows for that kind of rehearsing of how we make decisions together, how we choose, how we collectivize the resources, what we do about the problems that we see in our community. It forces people to take an affirmative stance towards making these kinds of shifts. And so I think that's in part why they're important as experiments, as why they're important as initiatives that we should be thinking through in our communities. It was such an amazing, um, and thank you for sharing all of that. It was such an amazing process um, to be a part of that. I was kind of um, our campaign and membership director, Devin Anderson. He was leading and holding the container of the steering committee. And I just would, you know, pop into meetings and just be with them, the resident leaders. So awesome to see them in that type of power, making decisions and um, creating a criteria and becoming excited about, you know, making sure young voices were able to also um, vote in, in that um, space. And so it's just been really exciting to, to hear the excitement and to see the faces when we gave those checks out um, in the community and people just saying like, you know, we don't know what we would have done, you know, without getting this additional money to support some of the work that we're doing, these things that are going to support young people and support people on the Northwest side. So it's been amazing to watch and be a part of, and we're looking forward to seeing um, how those resources, the $10,000 we gave the four different organizations um, will continue to support them building these uh, different safety spaces um, that support Northwest side residents um thanks so there's there's so much going on there's so much going on right now can you share your thoughts with us about the moment that we're in here both um here in the U.S. and what's happening also internationally well as I said earlier um in part Kelly and I wrote our book um let this radicalize you specifically trying to understand and share and really to figure out what we thought about um, how we continue to organize um, in an era of collapse. We were writing the book in the midst of the pandemic, um, which was a huge pandemic of, uh, you know, health pandemic around uh, uh, COVID-19. But it was also a pandemic of state violence in terms of policing. We were also in a pandemic that was an economic collapse for many people and scary times. Um, and all those things remain. Um, we're still in an epidemic of policing and violence, uh, which are you know, synonymous with each other. Uh, policing is inherently violence work. Um, you know, we all are still dealing with COVID-19. I think I just saw that a thousand people died last week um, from COVID. That, so that's still around. Um, you know, we are still dealing with economic dislocation where many people can't afford to uh, miss one paycheck. Should they do that, then they're probably out of their homes. Uh, you know, these are precarious times for everybody. I think now we're also dealing with the huge amounts of international uh you know tumult that always exists but that are exacerbated now with us direct support for a genocide in palestine and we are dealing with the genocide in the making in the congo and the displacement of millions and the ho ongoing horrors that are happening in sudan and in haiti uh, it is we are really in a moment of complete and utter, it feels like lots of convulsions um, and lots of pain and lots of harm and violence. And I think, as I said at the beginning, our brains as human beings, this is like human nature actually, is that we focus very intently on negative stuff. That is like our 
that's just how we move, right? It's the neuroscience is that we have a better ability to see the negative and that really kind of draws us. Um, and that that's why neuroscience really fast, you know, um, uh, fascinates me because, you know, it's something they call negativity bi bias. So because we're able to identify all of everything that's wrong, and it's much harder for us to identify what's actually going on that might be right. We have to change our focus to not just focus on all the problems before us because then we are drained and we are not able to push forward and keep keep struggling in my opinion. It really makes mm -hmm. it much more difficult to struggle together. So we have to be looking at, for example, the work you all are doing in the community and seeing the positives of where you are making a difference there. We have to also come together and grieve together. We need spaces to be able to be like, oh my God, this is a lot, I'm struggling and be with people who will hold that grief alongside you and accompany you through it. Um, we need to be in a position where we are, again, shifting the brain focus towards negativity to be like, yes, here's the bad, but then also here's the good. We have to constantly be pushing ourselves to do both, to be in a dialectical sense, looking at both ends of it all the time so that we remain realistic. Um, so I think it's a lot. There's a lot. Fascism is a problem right now uh, around the globe. Climate change, racism, and anti-Blackness remains you know, remains uh, on uh, happening on a regular basis. But again, um, I think it really is important for us to see ourselves as um, agents and rather than being acted upon and to figure out ways that we can build power to confront these very, very entrenched uh, forces of oppression that we are up against. Hmm. Indeed. Indeed. Um, when you were lifting up some of those things, it made me think about our asset mapping project. Um, you know, when we think about the northwest side of Milwaukee for folks here in Milwaukee, they know um, that the divestment on the northwest side is like, you know, a lot of times I think people think about um, central cities and say, oh, you know, they did this and they pulled this from there and they think about what the housing looks like. But here in Milwaukee, the northwest side, the outer um, skirts of the city going like right towards the suburbs in the area where we're organizing, they have gutted, like just gutted um, this area. There used to be malls and movie theaters and um, we had a go-karting, all of these things. And so when we moved on this side, of town, I grew up on this side of town. And so when we moved on this side of town, it was because we knew that there was not a lot of organizing here, but there's tons of black folks and there's tons of opportunity. And so with our asset mapping program that or a project that we did with Ubuntu, um, here, another uh, organization here in Milwaukee, we wanted to lift up the jewels. We did asset mapping in a way where it's like, we're not looking to see what's not happening. We're looking to see what's already here and let's build upon that and also lift it up so that people here in the neighborhoods and the communities know that these things exist. And so the other night we got a chance to do a soft launch with some residents. And it was so exciting because people were like, oh, I didn't know this existed. I didn't know this was here. I mean, I just learned of a youth uh, organization around the corner from my office. And we've been here since November, 2021, had no idea that this uh, organization was literally around the corner from us offering space to young people and families for parties and art and dinner together. And I was just like, this is super exciting. So we can't wait to do that hard launch um, next year. But it just made me think about that, like the things that we want to see, you know, folks when they ride down Brown Deer Road here in Milwaukee, they see the empty buildings, they see the lack of um, energy and green space. And we wanted to turn that thing on his head and say, yes, you might see that sometimes when you ride down here, but let me tell you the things that are hidden and what we can all bring to light and support um, here on the Northwest side. I love that. And really, yes, like also, you, you know, you're seeing a place that looks like there's a lot of lack going on here, but guess what? There's life here too. And it's really, really important to make sure that folks are constantly aware that that is what's going on, that there is always life also happening in places that appear to be on the surface, quote, lacking, 
you know, um, or not having anything or whatever. There's no such thing. There's always something that exists that's beautiful in every space. And even though the state has abandoned those spaces, even though they have organized themselves at it, around organized abandonment um, of those spaces, um, we then can still be in a position where we focus and see what is actually beautiful, what is a potential, what are the seeds that are there that just need a little bit more watering and tending to actually grow um, into like really beautiful fruit. So I love that that's work that you all are doing. It's wonderful. Yes, thanks so much. Um, so let's let's switch gears a little bit. So again, here to folks on the Northwest side and really city of Milwaukee and all over the world, um, when they think about the areas that they live in and they think about the changes that they want to see, sometimes it's hard for our, for our people to, to see past the divestment, to see past violence and what folks call crime in their neighborhoods. And then the way out, they feel like is this, you know, we just add more money to training for police, or if we add more money for them to get more access to, to different phone lines so that they can answer our calls quicker, or better cars, squad cars, so they can come to our rescue quicker. What how how do we have these continued conversations um, in our communities when folks are saying, you know, Marquesa, I, I know what you guys are talking about. I know you guys are practicing abolition, you know, but I can't practice that on my block. You know, I, I have to call the police because I have to do this and I have to make sure this person is safe and I got to move this way so I can be away from this and be away from that. How how do we continue to have those kind of conversations when we go out on the doors or when we're in communities talking about the city budget and we're saying no more money for police and people are like, actually, we need more money for police. Mm -hmm. How do we continue to have those types of conversations? Well, you know, I think that um, for me, abolition is about asking people regularly generative questions. Um, it's not about telling people what they should or should not want. Um, you know, I think you it's a losing proposition to do that. There's something called the boomerang effect, which is that if you tell somebody something that they hold dearly as a belief and you tell them that that belief is wrong, you're likely to actually be in a position where you strengthen them in that belief. Um, they then put up a situation and it's like, you're trying to take away my beliefs, you're trying to take away my ideas and my sense of myself and freedom, and you, you get an antagonistic kind of relationship with people. I have found over the years that the work is more just about asking people for what it is that they actually are trying to achieve. Um, what what it is that they actually want for themselves, you know, a question you would maybe ask on a regular basis is if somebody's talking about bringing the police into a situation is, well, what was the outcome of bringing the police into another situation that you had? What were the times in your life where you reached out to those folks and got what you needed from them? Oftentimes people, A, either did never reached out to them so what is the argument we're having then? We're having an argument that's abstract, you know, or they reached out to them and usually did not get what they needed. So you might ask people to really root into like, when are the times in your life that you really actually felt safe? What were the components of that, right? Like, and then how do we replicate those components? What's needed in order for that to happen? The reality is that people will cling to the familiar even if the familiar is failing them. And that is something that organizers constantly have to contend with. The familiar is actually something you know. <laughs> when it's not there, you're in uncertainty. And there's probably nothing that human beings hate more than uncertainty. And so they will do everything to cling to that certainty, that even if it's a false illusion of certainty, because it feels much more manageable and less scary than uncertainty. We have to know that and we have to work with people. We have to also remember that we didn't always think what we think. We didn't always have the beliefs that we had. Right. To me, I always say abolitionists are not born, they are made. It's you're made through your experience. You're, and for me, I'm in a lifetime of unlearning what I grew up with. I'm in a lifetime of that. My friend, um, Erica Miners, who's a brilliant um, 
uh, teacher and abolitionist thinker says that um, liberation under oppression is unthinkable by design, mm -hmm. by design. And so we literally have a situation where Chris Vargas, who's an artist and filmmaker, has written and said that like one of the most destructive aspects of the prison industrial complex is that it actually creates occupied imaginations. That means mm. that at what we are in is an imagination war. We are in a moment yes. where we have to like help people to get outside of things that are so familiar to them that feel like yes. actually the climate. <laughs> to tell somebody that like, no, you need, there's another way to go when this feels like it's just always been this way is hard treading. So we need to keep being in conversations with people. We need to do more showing and less telling. We need to offer spaces for unlearning and, and opportunities for political education together as we grow. And it's just going to take time. And to yeah. me, that's okay really is okay. We can take time together to build. And that's what you all are doing. That's what organizers do on a regular basis. We also don't spend time arguing about what people are quote unquote ready for. People mm. are ready for what they're ready for when they're ready for it. Your job right. is to present the information, to ask good questions, to offer resources and support, to keep being in the room with people, even if you disagree. Like there's a lot that we ought to do around that. And I'm sorry, but I came up doing, you know, uh, engaged in an abolitionist uh, struggle over two decades ago. And no one took abolitionist ideas even remotely seriously. So in that time, I have seen a sea change of young people who are growing up with like, why does it have to be this way? Actually, yes. right? Like they already, they already are questioning something I never at their age even thought was possible to question. It was so deeply ingrained that this, we always had cops. We were always going to have cops. We always had prisons. We were always going to have prisons. What were people even going to think? Of? Like it was, it was anathema to me growing up to think about that. I watch my God kids and my nibblings and they are constantly questioning stuff. Yes. You know? And I mean, that's just a sea change. So we, there'll be a new generation and they're going to have new ideas about what safety really means for them. And I think your questions as an organization, but also as organizers is to constantly stay with the question of asking people um you know uh, kind of what is safety for our communities and then we can ask what are the conditions that are actually going to increase that safety for everybody and for as or for as many people as possible and for me i i constantly want to also push us to perhaps stop using safety which is a weaponized and colonized term at yes. this point and to start thinking about it maybe as well-being or other kinds of terms that maybe don't immediately jump us to like the cops like it, right. just our brains or the prison like automatically push us there um so anyway so these are some thoughts that I have about that yeah yeah Makes me think about, yeah, cops and prisons live in our brains, uh, live in our hearts. In our um, heart. in our heart. Yeah. Cops are in our um, hearts. Oh, yeah, Paula Rojas' is a wonderful essay that she wrote many years ago. Yes. So with those things and those uh, that wisdom to organizers, for the folks who maybe don't consider themselves organizers in the room, what are some, what are some practical things that um, folks in their community, neighbors can be doing to create the the world that we want to live in? Hmm. I love this question because it assumes that we're all working in our own lanes to do what we can, how we can. That it's not a question of delegating the fight to someone else. This is collective struggle. Yeah. And you have to basically do what you can from where you are within your capacity. And that may be something that you notice and see and think is small, but I better it's better to bring your 
little tiny pebble to the fight and throw that in with other people's tiny pebbles so we make more ripples to actually be able to overcome this kind of the forces that are trying to basically destroy us and oppress us. So better that you do something than nothing, better that you do it with other people, better that you find a way to stay consistent in that, that it's not a short burst and then you totally burn out, but rather mm -hmm. that you continue and you continue and you continue. I started organizing when I was 14 years old and I just turned, uh, what, how old did I turn? 52. I can't, you can't mm. remember these years now as it goes on 52 or 53 probably. Um, but anyway, and I, um, I think about this on a regular basis around people ask me a lot about longevity. Like how did you, how have you kept in the fight over all these years? And all I can say is I haven't done it alone. I'm mm. not in a place where I have to do everything because I can't but rather I look for what it is that I'm uniquely suited to being able to contribute to. And I do that. I do that. And I think to myself, well, that's enough. It's enough for me. It's going to have to be enough for the world. I cannot change the world as an individual, one person, simply not going to happen. I'm going to have to do it with other people. And I, I saw um, um, a, a piece recently that um, a person, uh, a friend of mine sent me that was a a new book that just got published, I think last week um, by somebody named um, uh, Omkari Williams, Omkari Williams. And, um, and he, he says uh, it, it's a book called micro activism, how you can make a difference in the world without a bullhorn. And what he tries to do is he helps people to identify their activist archetype and then map a personal kind of action plan for engaging in small things that you can do. I think that's a good way to start, to start mm -hmm. small and where you are and in your own space and communities and then grow from there. I also love a wonderful piece that Deepa Iyer created uh, a few years ago called the Social uh, social change e ecosystem. I don't know if you ecosystem map. I don't know if you all use this with young people or anybody. I have used it in our um, training institutes with young people, and we are using it now in a cohort uh, that we are running on Tuesday nights for new organizers. And it's such a wonderful tool to help, sh like, show you all the different roles that exist in the social justice ecosystem, including. Um, the role of a builder, of a weaver, of a connector, of a, you know, artist, of a, like all these different ways we can come together to make and shift our culture um, towards something more liberatory in our society, towards something more liberatory. So there are ways to, to act, um, but you always have to act. I think importantly, try to act with other people. It makes it, it makes it better. Yes, I'm I'm writing notes. I definitely want those. I, I'm going to look for that book and also yeah. the social ecosystem. Yes, I, I want um, in on that as well. Um, making me think about Adrienne Marie Brown, fractals and small is all, you know, and making these ripple effects. So I am so for that. It's something that I think that we've been able to do through our Invest Divest campaign, where it's like, um, we as African American Roundtable and um, folks who are here on staff, we ran this Invest Divest campaign since 2019, um, calling for a divestment from police and investment into the community. And um, we started off doing it as a coalition. We quickly learned in 2020 that coalition was not something we were going to continue to be able to hold because of the pandemic, presidential election, and just all the things that were, uh, were happening during that time. And so we decided to start building up our membership. We said, you know, um, M. Adams has told us our movements need more people. And so we are answering that call. And we did so through membership. Mm -hmm. But before we we got to membership um, through the Liberate MKE campaign, we brought in fellows. So we did a cohort every year and we brought in folks, residents, you know, young people. Hey, do you want to learn how to organize around the city budget? And people are like, absolutely. And so we've run this this cohort every year. And again, people may not feel like they're organizers, but they're they're everyday citizens who live in neighborhoods all across the city of Milwaukee who are saying, 
I actually do have a say about the city budget. I actually That's want right. to tell my author person where I want my funds to go. And I want them to go to libraries or pave in new streets. And so it's been yeah. exciting to pull in mothers and grandmothers and, and young people and teachers and other folks to say, we can give you the tools. You don't have to do this nine to five, but we can give you the tools to use your voice to be a part of a process of making that kind of change and then asking you to bring in other people into that process. And then again, just like that ripple effect. What can I do with the time that I have when I'm off of work after five o'clock? So doing those cohorts in the evening time, getting people together on the weekends has been really, really delicious. And we're so proud of our fellows who I'm sure some are here with us who have been doing the work with us since 2019 and folks who are just joining our cohort this year who've been on with us. Uh, actually, we ran the cohort um, from the spring all the way until, well, actually it was probably late winter, all the way until November where the budget just wrapped up. So it's been so exciting and people saying like, after the cohort is over, still want to be a part, like I still want to do something. And it's so exciting to be able to offer new opportunities and ways for them to be able, but also reminding them, you don't have to just do all your building here at the round table go and do that stuff in your neighborhood go do it at your church go do it with your family and all of these other places um as well i think that's wonderful and it just it, it shows again not everyone has to be an organizer quote unquote big o right uh, you but everybody can be a leader in their own community in their own way in their own life so i think mm -hmm. that that's a way to think about this as well is you know most of us I've done most of our organizing for her whole entire lives unpaid. It's not work that pays you to do that work. You do it in addition right. to having jobs, having families, doing other kinds of things. And that to me isn't going to change anytime soon. So we really need to think of ourselves as kind of agents of our own lives um, and in people who actually can want to, we have something to contribute and we should do it. Right. So as I'm preparing to wrap up, I just have a few more questions. One, um, Dr. King described the beloved community as a space of social equity and belonging, peace and freedom from prejudice. How do you describe beloved community? I don't know. That's a hard question for me. Um, I think mainly because I... I I have a fraught relationship with the question of love. I think love is essential for revolutionary struggle. I really believe that. And I think that, sorry. Um, I think that love is, um, love is essential for revolutionary struggle. I absolutely believe that. Everybody that I admire, who is a touchstone of mine over history and time and present, uh, lives in that way. But I also worry about sometimes the way that love gets used um, to paper over the really distressing inequalities that must be directly tackled and struggle to overcome. Like that it can sometimes lead people to be passive rather than active. And um, so I, I, I struggle with that quite a bit. I think that relationships are a key foundation of a life well lived. Um, Elliot Fukui, Fukui um, from Fireweed um, Collective says that, you know, kind of relationships are, are, are our main resource. And I agree with that. Um, meaningful connections are really important to our well being as human beings. And I think, in part, what we try to talk about in Let This Radicalize You is that reciprocal care is about fostering a sense of belonging. Um, we discussed the idea of belonging quite a bit in our first chapter, and we also could have just written a whole separate chapter on this really important idea. And for me, I think a lot about a quote by Grace Lee Boggs um, that I've been thinking about through our pandemic years. And she says, you know, when it, we never know how our small activities will affect others through the invisible fabric of our connectedness. It's in this exquisitely connected world. It's never a question of critical mass it's always a question of critical connections. And mm. I think about that a lot when I think about the concept of beloved community. I also think about the reality that individual actions aren't enough and that we need collective action, of course. But here's the thing, individual actions are also necessary. Um, we talk about kind of efforts in the book that people took 
to get community members vaccinated when they weren't able to do that themselves or didn't know how to do it or were afraid to do it, right? These individual efforts that were kind of connected to collective infrastructure supported those individual acts. So I think that those are kind of the things that I think about when I'm thinking about beloved community. I think obviously about love and the fraught nature of it. I think about the importance of critical connections. And I think about, yes, belonging. Um, but part of that is like figuring out how we can belong to each other um, better um, and, and how we can strengthen those those sense, the sense of belonging and uh, overcome a lot of loneliness that I think a lot of people feel in a very disconnected post, you know, uh, kind of late stage capitalist uh, space that we're inhabiting right now. So yeah, good, it's a good question. And thank you for answering it. Um, one thing that you talked about love and I started to snicker my um, husband, I think, has hinted around to this, not in the way that you said it, but in regards to faith, people in faith, and sometimes mm -hmm. just using the blanket of love, you know, to, oh, to forgive, which causes this passivity and people to forget, you know, have that that short memory about actually, yeah, I understand the concept of forgive and forget, but um, let's yeah. not let it lead us to passivity and let's not use this blanket of love to let people slide, yeah. um, to let people get away with um, the oppressive conditions that they've been putting on um, people yeah. for decades and generations exactly. and generations so yes that that I resonated with and also the thing around relationships um it is it is my bread and butter it is what um it is what holds me in this work um that connectiveness uh it's what has allowed me to to build the round table I've been a director since 2017 I was a part of the round table in 2014 as as a member and then as a director in 2017. And it's what it's what helped to build that coalition of over probably 50 or 60 coalition partners when we first started Liberate MKE. It's what has helped us to build a strong infrastructure and an institution that we're building. Um, it's been the relationships. It hasn't been um, because we, you know, I think a part of it is, yeah, we've done some great work, but it's the relationships that we've built that causes people to trust and spend time and want to be with us and to build um, the thriving communities that we deserve here in the city of Milwaukee. So I, I so resonate with, I love love as well, but, and um, the importance of the connectiveness of relationships. I love that uh, word, critical, those two words, critical connections. They are definitely critical, especially in these times. So as I wrap up, since this is um, celebration of programs, we are fundraising, even though we're, that's not the, the biggest thing, you know, being with um, community and lifting up the programs and the work that we're doing alongside people in the community. My last question is, why is it so important to financially support Black-led organizations like the Roundtable? Yeah, I mean, I just, um, first of all, I'm so I, I'm so heartened to know about the work you all are doing in the world. It keeps me going. Um, it gives me a sense of ongoing kind of hopefulness about what is possible in the world and what we can do together if we have the right resources and supports and all of that other stuff. And so I'm I'm just so grateful to the round table for all your work and um you know, what you all offer uh to us because it's a model and a way to actually be able to make real changes that will impact people's lives. And ultimately that's really what we care about the most is how are we going to transform our conditions so that more of our people actually are free and have safety or well-being um, where they're unimpeded and can move in the world and do the things that they want to do for themselves, their loved ones and their communities. Um, so I think that these we're not going to get there without having money and resources. Um, and while it's not the only thing, it is an extremely, extremely important thing. We have to be able to put our values into uh, action, into uh, kind of materialize our values through making decisions about what we support and we have to support that with funds. We talked at the beginning about the fact that um, people are often disempowered from making decisions of how 
our resources are going to be used uh, in our in our cities, in our states, in the larger federal government. And that part of what you're doing with participatory budgeting is putting people at the table of making the decisions in part about some part of that going to community life affirming things rather than the death making things. When we are working in community, we need resources to be able to do this ongoing work. And we have to show up as community members to support things we think are imp important to us. Um, we have to resource our organizations, particularly Black-led organizations, because these are not organizations that people are funding at high levels, right? A lot of groups are struggling to make, to make ends meet. They're struggling to be able to provide stipends to people to be so that we can have a more diverse number of people fighting together because people don't have resources and therefore can't get involved in their communities in the ways that they would like. So we need to be able to have resources to provide stipends, even just resources to provide food at meetings. Who's going to pay mm -hmm. for that? You have an office space that you need to meet at a meeting. You need to pay for meeting space. A lot of places in cities now do not offer free space to people to meet. So folks have to cover that. You have to pay people and you have to pay them a living wage to be able to continue this kind of work. And that is also part of our values. So how do we get the resources to do that, right? So I always see this as, to me, fundraising is part of organizing. It absolutely is. They come together. And people say the corny thing of fundraising is friend raising, but I believe that. I think that when you take a stake in a institution as a friend of the institution and you put down your money to support that institution, that's a concrete way that you are saying, what you're doing is important to me. I wanna be part of it. I wanna help invest in this. I wanna help grow this. Very, very important. Um, I think organizations, though, on the other hand, should then take people more seriously and involve them in how the organization is moving, um, offer more transparency and show people how the money is being used to help further the overall mission. We cannot be in a position where people give money to organizations, whether they're black led or not, and nobody knows what the hell's going on with the funds. We owe it to our communities for them to know what the hell is going on with the funds and how it's being used and how it's supporting the overall mission of the thing they signed up to support. So I think these are all important things to keep in mind. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. You guys heard it here first. All of the things, all of the things that Miriam Kaba um, has so graciously shared with us before we come completely close. Is there anything else you want to add before I close out and get back to our program? Um, no, thank you again for inviting me, for having me, for um, allowing me to be part of celebrating your organization and all the work that you all do and all your people. And um, I just want to just remind us that like, we're in this for the long haul. And um, we do this in large part because of our deep abiding care for each other and our communities. And in times that are super hard like these, we need each other more than ever. And so I hope that people will hold on to each other where you are um, and find a way to be able to work and grieve and celebrate together regularly. Um, and ultimately I'll say that I really do believe we're gonna end up winning. So keep up your work. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yes, I believe that we will win. It's been a joy and a pleasure to be in space with you today. And I look forward to talking to you in the future. Thank you Thank so you. much. Thanks, Marquesa.